Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I am your host, Matt Belair, and today we have another fantastic guest for you. He is a professional speaker and clinical sports psychologist in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He has built a successful career helping athletes and other high achieving, oh, sorry, I have, I'm trying to read this off my phone and just butchering it. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there, wait, is this even written correctly? What am I doing here? Hold on. This guy, I'm just going to wing it because I've, I've already ruined it. Um, he's a sports psychologist. He's a peak performance expert. Um, also says down here you're a consultant through the Association of Applied Sports Psychology and member of the U.S. Olympic Committee. So I thought that was important. So I better uh, get that in there as I as I butcher your intro. But uh, yeah, well, let me clarify that it's not the committee; it's a sports psychology registry, and there's a big difference. So I don't want to be don't want to false represent myself. But uh, oh. we, we can talk about that in a bit. Yeah. All right. Well. Well. Welcome to the show, Eddie O'Connor. Probably the worst intro. <laughs> I added, like seventy one. Do, do you want me to take it over? Do you want me to give it a shot? Yeah. 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 Little <laughs> role reversal. Just like. Oh, yeah. man. No, that's all right. So we'll, we'll, we'll start over. So as we were joking earlier about there's something in the air today, right? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a sports psychologist. That's how I got started. And I love working with athletes and other high performers, high achievers. Because um, it's also not only in sport, of course, but whether it be high risk professions, performing artists, people who have to perform under pressure. Um, so I work with all of those to be their very best. And um, I've really gotten into the public speaking because I find, and, and opportunities like this, so let me start off with a thank you. Um, love helping people one-on-one, -on -one, helping them be their best in individual plans, but cannot reach enough people, help enough people, because there's not enough hours in the day. So have particularly enjoyed recently, you know, doing media, uh, whether it be TV or speaking engagements, being able to bring performance excellence um, to, to the more people, the better. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. Awesome, man. We, we began with the co-creation. <laughs> uh, um, that's cool. Well, how did you get into this? What's a, what's a little bit about your background? Were you always interested in, in psychology, peak performance, or, or what happened? Yeah, you know what? It, it's, it's a, I think it's a funny story, but you know, psychologists, you, you tend to look at what they study and you kind of be like, okay, doctor, heal thyself. What's your issue? Uh, particularly, I think, in psychology. And that's really the case with me. I was a I was a runner. I loved running. Um, I was 800 cross country. Um, was maybe the best of the worst and the worst of the best, very average, but worked extremely hard and, and just absolutely loved my whole identity was really wrapped up in being a runner. And so high school goes on to get injured, um, run a little bit in college, but then, you know, kind of lose that and just kind of go on. And I always wanted to be a psychologist and last class I took in college, Thank goodness, the very last class. I knew I wanted to be a psychologist, but I take this class called sports psychology. I'm like, what the heck is that? Um, I was fascinated by the class and knew absolutely at that moment that's what I wanted to do. Now, at first, I was a little upset because I'm like, I could have used this information for the last eight years. Right now, at the end of college, exactly when <laughs> you know everything's done um, from a you know a competition standpoint, at least in the sense of a uh, higher competition. Um, but just became fascinated and was able to really bring together my desire to help people uh, get over difficulties. So I specialized in clinical psychology, but tweaked it so that I would specialize in the difficulties that athletes and performers would suffer with most. So I got training and expertise in pain and injury rehabilitation. I do a lot with perfectionism, performance anxiety. So really more of a specialist, not only in the uh, mental toughness and performance enhancement, but for people who are kind of slumping and falling apart um, to kind of capture them, particularly within an athletic or performance context and help them through the barriers that performers tend to suffer with. Um, and that's where you get into sort of the credentials. I got uh, certified and I'm a fellow in the organization, uh, the Association of Applied Sports Psychology. And as part of that, um, I've joined with the US Olympic Committee as being on their, on their registry to be available to uh, athletes uh, pursuing their Olympic dreams. Awesome, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, you know, a little bit of my background too is that, you know, doing like the sports psychology, things like that. And, you know, as I'm learning it in my early 20s, I'm just like, why the heck don't I know? Like, why didn't I know this? Why didn't they not teach this to me? Because I could have been using this, you know, so long ago. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, it's really powerful information. And you know, for a lot of the listeners, you know, they're not they're not really athletes, uh, but they're everyday folk. But one of the things that I like to say is when you take like um, those tools that a high performer needs, a professional athlete, an Olympian, but you apply that to your daily life, um, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to be such a level up on on everyone around you because you know through extreme sports and things like that they have a necessity to to level up their game you know if you're just going oh, to yeah. your daily job you might not have that uh that necessity but you can still use the tools there's no reason why you know you can't apply those tools you just you know they're available to you yeah, you, you cannot be intimidated by seeing oh well, this is for the nba or a high level because we are all performers and particularly when you look at psychology you know, there is nobody living on earth that doesn't have to interact with their thoughts and their emotions in the pursuit of some type of goal. So if you just want to be a good parent, and I don't mean just because that's very difficult. I've got four kids of my own. Um, but if you want to be a good worker, if you want to, if you want to stick to a diet, if you want to have a, a regular exercise program, if you want to be good at your job, if you want to love your partner well, all of those things require us to overcome the mental challenges, the doubt, the worry, all of which is completely normal. The idea, I think the secret to performance excellence um, is really learning how to work with all of these human barriers because I've never found anybody to actually beat them. I, I don't know anybody that's beaten negative thinking. I've thought negative today. You and I talked. We've been negative a little bit in the first you know, couple of minutes. Can't help it. You can't help what shows up, but you can help what, how you react to it and what you do about it when it shows up. And that's where you and I work with people, not only athletes, performers, but people to help me be better in that way. Yeah, amazing. Totally agree. Um, so, in in your work in um, you know dealing with athletes, high performers, what do you find? You know, because it is it is very common. You know, so weird. You know, the more you do, the more you realize that we're all the freaking same. You know, so you get yeah. the same problem in, in like different ways. Like, no, nah, no, nah, like I know that problem, and then you kind of figure out all the techniques and tools, you know, strategies to help them find their own way through it. Cause again, they got to do it. Can't be you. You can show them the way and, and they have to do it. Um, what do you find are some of the most common problems that the average Joe has? And then maybe some solutions to those problems. Yeah. I should make a quick story ahead of time that you remind me. And I still laugh because early in my career, and maybe this is actually what performers have. You're always like, am I good enough? Right. Do I know everything? So I got my degree and I'm practicing. But then I had um, an NFL pro bowler who was going through rehab who come in, came in uh, to this clinic that I was at and was going to pop in and was going to have one session with me. And I'm all geeked out and I'm excited, right? I want to work with this NFL player. I can't wait. And I am taking out every textbook and every book and flipping through it and, rem- and reading all my notes from the last you know, five years all over again, which is, of course, I'm reading it. And I'm like, I know this. I know this. I know this. But he's the same. You know, he walks in and he talks to me like a normal human being. <laughs> I was like... Wow. And then his, the things that we needed to work on in my mind, I'd seen a thousand times. It was simple and got some benefit and we moved on. And I was like, you know, that was strangely normal <laughs> because I expected, you know, for these, again, high performers or athletes and, and to, to be different. And you're right. Like any pros or anybody else that comes through, what I see common through everybody, confidence and positive thinking are important. But people get rattled when they don't have that. We are in love when we can be zoned in and then we have the flow state. And by all means, it makes it a heck of a lot easier. But we all get challenged by it in the sense that I've never known anybody to live in that ideal state 24-7. And so all of us need to do what we can to deal with maybe the normal anxiety that shows up, the, the normal doubt. And you don't feed it and you don't, uh, you know, just kind of, oh, well, that doesn't matter. But at the same time, we have to interact with it. I I talk about, they did this recent study in 2014 that that fascinated me. We used to think there were six, maybe seven basic human emotions. And they've done a recent study that, you know, across the world, like about 35,000 people, all these cultures, and found out that through facial recognition studies, we only have four basic human emotions. And I'll let you guess. What do you think those four basic emotions are? Hmm. Okay. So, I, when, okay. Uh, four basic human emotions. Yeah. Uh, frustration. That comes, out, joy, that comes out of one of them. What's the other one? Uh, frustration, joy, doubt, confusion. Um, close. Actually, but it's more basic. Happy, right. sad, mad, 
and scared. Right. And the frustration and joy and other things kind of come out of those categories. But facial recognition, happy, sad, mad, scared. Hmm. How many of those are positive? One. So in experience, three quarters of it kind of sucks. <laughs> and good luck going to the Olympics. Good luck you know, being in a pressure moment and not feeling anxious. Good luck something bad happening in your life and you're not being sad about it. Good luck you know, seeing some social injustice and not being angry. So if we are trying to constantly strive to squash all these emotions and rather than accept them and perform with them, that's what I think is what ties us into the common humanity. We all have to live in a world that involves suffering, that's broken. And yet we still want to excel. And it's not by controlling it. It's not by controlling and forcing and fighting with our thoughts and feelings, emotions to make them ideal. It's a matter of a certain amount of acceptance and then intentional and valued living with all the crap that's there. <laughs> That's amazing, man. I love that. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. It's like the Zen fundamental of acceptance, right? That's yeah, like yeah, absolutely. In, in different ways. But I, I like how you're um, adding the four basic human emotions and, and really just coming in and bringing to surface what is normal. And another really amazing point that you brought up already, which is awesome after the races here, is um, just seeing how it's the everyday stuff. It's like, you know, you, you, a lot of people will say, oh, well, at this point in time, that's when I've got to use all my mental fortitude and you know what I mean? All the skills that I have. Well, guess what? You got 99% of life before that one tiny percent that you got to deal with. And that's where the real mastery comes in. Um, and it's the step one is recognizing that, right? Because if you go through oh, the, yeah frustrated and pissed off and you have no, you know, mental acuity or mental skill set, it throws off the whole thing. So that's really where the mastery comes in. So I love how you touched on that. Um, so what do you think, what are some ways that we help people, number one, identify, you know, when we're getting into these loops, whether it's the three quarters of frustration and, and how to, what are some ways to deal with that? You know, I feel like recognition is very important, you know, so you don't oh, yeah. steamroll yourself into, uh, you know, creating more of it and then how, what are some solutions that someone can have to um, overcome the anxiety, self doubt, you know, self beating the crap, you know? Sure. Like sure. So um, a big part of my practice is mindfulness. My interventions are mindfulness based. Um, I had colleagues in the Olympics have talked for a while that they would talk about how nothing happens without awareness and mindfulness is a, a huge, huge component of that. Um, and so being able to um, involve a daily mindfulness practice, because as you had said, you can't really turn a lot of these things on um, without having a, a daily repetition, a daily development of the mindfulness skill. Um, you just cannot, it's impossible to um, just turn things on uh, when you need them, uh, because that's when it's most difficult to do it. You get into this automatic, you look a little bit of brain science, you got the top-down thinking that mindfulness can develop, it's slower, it's intentional, it short circuits that bottom up thinking in the brain that's quite instinctual and, and more uh, uh, from our more primitive parts of our brain. And so when that gets activated, you need the mindfulness to be able to slow it. That only happens with a uh, practice and um, uh, daily intention. And let me switch this. I'm going to move my camera here a little bit. Uh, an extra battery so I don't get disconnected from you. <laughs> And so as you're at, um, with the work that I do, I, I like to start my, my performers and athletes off with um, a, a daily mindfulness practice, whether it's um, an open meditation, um, getting into a, a centering breath, focusing um, so they, uh, on, on their, their breath and the sensations in their nose so that they can um, really control that as, you, as you're well familiar, and I'm sure your listeners are too. Uh, mindfulness is uh, paying attention on purpose, in the present moment without judgment. And that's how we perform our best. You know, it, we have to know in our sport and our life, where is it that we want to direct our attention and purposely put it there. And we only perform in the moment. If it's a second of past or looking to the future, our performance in the moment suffers. And we want to execute our skills quickly and automatically. And if we think it slows it down and it disrupts it. So I have not found anything better than the mindfulness practice. Um, to change the brain, again, as you know, the physiology of the brain changes, you get more gray matter, thickening of the cerebral cortex. I mean, you, it's exciting to me that when you sit and you meditate, that you're changing your brain. In the same way, like you do push-ups, you get bigger chest muscles. When you meditate, you get bigger brain. 
And when you have a bigger, stronger brain, everything is better. So that's absolutely foundational. And since I've added that to my clinical practice with athletes on top of the mental skills, um, the results are just, just that much better because again, we're developing their brain um, and their strength, not just uh, their skills and their application. Yeah, man, I totally agree. And I think it's a good point again, that you're, you're touching on that. It's a training, right? So you might know that if you do bench press or push ups, you get a better che- a bigger chest and you get stronger, you do squats, get stronger legs. But if you go, don't go do them, you do not get <laughs> yeah. legs. And so I think that a lot of hesitancy for a lot of people is that they're confused because they can't feel their muscles get sore and they can't see the result. Um, it's more of this, you know, intangible at first until, you know, like you can't feel anything, but you know, a week or two weeks later or a month later, then you're really going to notice. So it takes like this little bit of faith to start. And that's where I like sport and uh, sports performance. The more the people that I coach that have the most amount of danger are more likely to do whatever I tell them the least amount of danger yeah. and, uh, you know, consequence, the, it, the harder it is for me to convince them. And that's why when I work with people, I'm like, I, you know, I'm not going to spend any time. And even in my book, I don't spend any time convincing you why this works. If you don't know this works, you can go read a different book and you can come back like at a different time. Like this is, you know, you got to be there. Right. So like, I don't, I don't got time for that. Um, <laughs> so um, how do you kind of like educate and then motivate people to, you know, say, Hey, look, this is maybe you give them a little science. Like, how do you do that? We're like, yo, you got to do this and it works. You know, that's for me, probably the most frustrating thing. And I don't even deal with it. Yeah. You know, uh, you're speaking to my heart. I I know that I fell in love with sports psychology and performance enhancement, like I said, right from the beginning. And I probably spent a a number of years being like, I need, the world needs to know this. This is too good to keep it like, like, and everybody, except I found out that not everybody was excited about it as I was. Um, besides the fact that, and it's okay, not everybody wants to be excellent, right? It's hard work. It takes tremendous sacrifice and, and, and incredible suffering and pain. Not, maybe not suffering, but sacrifice and pain. So I've learned that maybe not everybody's as excited about it. So at the same time, I don't know that anybody will ever do anything without knowing the why. And so depending on the performer that comes in, sometimes I'll tell them like sort of a personal story, like if they're more like storytelling and they enjoy it. And so I go, you know, I tell about my personal experience. Like I, you know, had some rough times in my life. I thought, you know, maybe mindfulness and meditation would be something that I should explore and do. Uh, Similarly, I said, okay, let me try it. Went on. Um, You don't really feel it right away. You might feel relaxed, but that's not the point the first day or two. But I'll never forget the surprise that I'd had. I'd been months into it. And I'm, I'm, at at this point in my career, I'm the leader of a medical team. And so there's a lot going on. And we were had to our vice president told us we had to move our clinic and I had like hundreds of patients, a staff of about 15 people. And they were like, you need to be out of your place of business in three weeks and be over this other place. And I'm like, well, nobody consulted me. And you know, normally I'm pretty upset and angry about this kind of thing. Um, And I was taken aback, but was like, okay, you realize that's what the company needs. And um, it was a little upset during the day, but went home driving to work the next day. I remember opening the office door and just problem solving thing. Okay, I need to do this, need to do that. We're on a deadline, da, da, da. And I have my key in the door and I stop and I go, oh, what the heck's the matter with me? Why am I not angry? Like it totally surprised me why I wasn't like flipping out and having an attitude and being all, I was like, I am so handling this. <laughs> and so we go on, I'm like, okay, whatever, must be the mindfulness. And so two weeks go on, I put all my work aside and, you know, we're, we're, we're on target to make it. I get a call. You know what? You don't have to move. So normally I'm all ticked off again because I just wasted two weeks of my life chasing something, you know, all our, you know, and I go, okay, hung up the phone was like, okay, told everybody we could stay. Things are cool. Back to normal. Let's get back to work. And I'm like, why am I not more upset? <laughs> Must be the mindfulness. And you hear stories like this all the time that the wonderful thing about mindfulness is that it's not, you learn that way. It's not a technique to make you feel better in the moment. It changes the way you relate to life. You become more efficient in your thinking, right? There was nothing for me to be upset about because I couldn't do anything about it. It naturally enhanced my acceptance. Yes, it was frustrating. Yes, it was a waste of time. But what could I do about it? And what, why waste the energy and take away from my performance getting all distracted by it? And mindfulness did that quite automatically because of the daily practice. 
So some people can hear those stories and relate to it. Sometimes I do take the science, like, like I'd said, and I'll show pictures of brains and this is how you know, your brain changes and people really like that. Um, sometimes I go with like, you know what, how long has mindfulness been around? 2,500 years, 3,000? I mean, nothing stays around that long if it doesn't work. <laughs> and have you ever heard anybody, anybody in the history of the world say that they did mindfulness and that it didn't help or that they had a negative side effect? In the history of the world, I have never, ever heard that. And that's pretty rare. That is pretty rare. So you take one of those three angles or, you know, now even actually more recently, you can just really point to all of in the Olympics and professional ranks, all the people that are using it now. I say, you know, Western world is kind of caught up. What we could do functional MRIs and brain scans. We didn't want to believe that what people, ancient people have known forever, that this is really powerful. But now that we can take pictures of the brain, America's on board with it. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. And uh, I love your angles. It, it's a different, you know, different ways for different people to try to motivate them into this world, which shouldn't need any motivating. Yeah. So now that we got them into the world, um, what are some of your favorite tools and techniques for peak performance or daily life? Um, you know, the one thing that I really heard, um, and I want people to just really understand is like, it becomes a practice, you know, like if you don't practice, you don't get better. But once you, once you learn to ride the bike, like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, he did trans transcendental meditation for like every day for a year. Um, and then he just stopped using it. Now I don't recommend people stop, but what he did is he learned the skill. So then he learned that he wasn't his thoughts and he got all of these uh, benefits and, you know, he realized what it was so he can tap into that skill. But before that he didn't have the skill. Um, so what are some of your favorite tools or are somebody listening so they can start to apply it? Maybe they're just like a regular Joe, maybe they're a peak performer. Um, yeah. what are your favorite tactics for, for just achieving at a higher, higher level? Yeah. You know, one of the things going back to your question about what do people struggle with the most? And I think this applies to everybody. And, and I really wish that you would teach this like in third grade and, and how my life would have been different if I had known this, but our brains have a job to do. Our survival instinct for our brain is essentially to worry. Maybe not have a panic attack and stuff, right? That's too much. But what our brain does is it searches out the environment and points at all the things that could go wrong. That's what it does. And any more than you can't take a turtle out of its protective shell or get a skunk to not spray you or a chameleon to, to bite you instead of change color, you can't change this survival instinct. So the first thing I started off with my, my, my performers is, is I'm like, recognize that when you worry, when you are concerned, you have those doubts, not only is it normal, but it has to happen. Because if you care and you love what you're doing, it is now automatically a threat because failure in something that you love is going to hurt you. A, a person that you love or is dating uh, or that you're committed to, they now have the power to hurt you because you care about that. If you invest your time, your money, your effort into something, it now has the power to hurt you. And so your brain, no matter how good you are, no matter how talented you are, will tell you every little thing that could go wrong. And it becomes our job to not believe it, not to hold on to it. Now, a turtle, if it goes across the street, for example, and a car is coming, it's going to naturally go into its shell. And it's going to get run over by the car and die because the shell is not strong enough to do it. And that's what we end up doing. So I, I kind of relate my performers to them in this way. You might relate to this. You know, we do these automatic things to protect ourselves out of worry and, and we kill our performance. But unlike a turtle, what we can do is we can learn and say, this is just an instinct. Now, the turtle shell works. I think it's like a dinosaur, right? I don't know how long it's been around, but it's obviously not fast and fierce, but the shell works for survival. And our worry, this searching out for danger, works, but it's never 100%. So unlike the turtle that dies under the car because it automatically responds, what we want that turtle to do is two things, and I teach my athletes this. First is, like you said, have awareness that you're having this urge and don't do anything with it. And then secondly, do something that's completely unnatural. The turtle would have to not, not have the urge, which is what most athletes want. I want to get rid of the anxiety. It's a waste of time. Understand that the anxiety is there. Don't attach to it. Here's where the mindfulness helps. And then intentionally do the opposite. The turtle should run. He sucks at it, but it's the only thing that's going to give him a chance to survive. And it still may not work, but we know it's in his best interest. And my athletes can understand that. And so we move on to that idea that I can feel anxiety. I can have doubts, but I don't have to respond to them. 
Let me ask you, if you, Matt, did everything that ever crossed your mind, if you acted on every urge, you're smiling, that you have ever had, where would you be right now? <laughs> Probably dead, man. <laughs> yes, and I only get one other answer, dead or in jail. From everybody, from nine-year-old gymnasts to you know, 60-year-old masters athletes and everybody in between, we all have the same answer. If we, so we're already good at letting go of our thoughts and feelings. And if we can recognize the independence of our actions, that's where my, my athletes, my performers get control. If we can recognize that our actions are independent of what we think and feel. Now, often they go together, right? I feel hungry, I think I better get a sandwich and I go to the refrigerator. It's cool when it all works together. But if we can tolerate the discomfort, if we can learn to observe like you had said, sit with it in a moment, focus on what we ultimately want, that we can act independent of what we think and feel. And I find that, that that's a, if we can get that independence and we can really practice and recognize how to observe what we think and feel and then act in a valued, intentional way, that's when we become the master of our lives and our performance. I love that. I 100% agree. I think it's very on point, very congruent. So now my question is, uh, you have four kids. Um, yeah. And the reason why I'm so passionate about Zen Athlete and getting this information out as are you, because like if we could teach every 5, 10, 15-year-old all these things that i learned over a lifetime of martial arts and study the same field, you know, this, this stuff. Is it, why do we not know this, you know? So for you, um, you know, what principles would you empower parents to teach their kids uh, with mm -hmm. and, and how, how what, what tools did you bring to kids and how would you, would you bring it to, you know, make this normal? Because, you know, this is something we should talk about off the air. But, um, you know, my goal is to bring, you know, mental training just as normal as fit physical training. It's, if anything, more important. So if we were teaching, you know, kids from 5 to 15-year-old all these um, timeless techniques – uh, it's going to change the world, I think, anyway. So I'm just curious about how you would go about doing that and what you would bring to them. Yeah, well, my head is, is spinning. There's any number of ways. Um, when I think about parents, and again, in my role as a sports psychologist, a lot of times parents come and you get, you're yelling at the refs, coaching at the sideline. And so if you follow me on, on Instagram, uh, you might have seen my recent one about, I just took those outside of the bleachers and I was like, parents, we got to be better than this. You got to cut this out. They're screaming at refs. And I kind of went on a little bit of a, a rant. But boy, it got, you know, particularly on my Facebook page, it got a lot of positive responses. So really, when I think about parents, the first thing I think of is, man, it doesn't matter what you say to your kids. They're watching you. It's not do as I say, not as I do. They're going to do what you model. And so if you want your kids to be in emotional control, demonstrate emotional control. If you want them to be respectful and honest, don't be like telling them when they're 15 to go you know, tell them to say that you're 12 so you can get a, a cheap movie ticket, you know, like they, they see everything. They see everything. And so the best thing that we can do, it's kind of like, you know, in the airplanes, right? The masks come down. You got to put your mask on first and then help the kid. <laughs> and so if you want these things for your kids, we as a parent have to live them. And we have to believe them because they're not going to, they don't believe the words that we say if our actions are in contrast to that. You know, you, you can't be smoking and then telling them don't smoke, it's bad for you. It's never going to work. So it's a lot easier to tell our kids what to do. <laughs> and I find that it's harder. Like my kid, I, I shouldn't even be saying this in public, but what the heck, we're all friends, right? So at a stressful point in my life and I got four kids and they fight <laughs> and they sometimes will get at each other. And so when one person hits another and the other one's hitting back and yelling, and I'm yelling at them, you guys can't be fighting. You gotta stay, you know, just walk away. And, like, and I'm yelling at them about keeping emotional control. My daughter at like nine years old was looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> are you serious? Like, how can I be yelling at them to calm down? That makes no sense. And it honestly wasn't until I started to calm down and have much better control over that there's more peace in my house they stopped fighting because i was less irritable now i'm like now i admitted that to the world but you know i i, I don't think i'm probably alone in this right and i should know better i do this for a freaking living <laughs> but we're all human right and so that's the number one thing that i would say parents 
you know, adapt these practices yourself. If, if you love it and you really want it for your kids, love yourself enough to give it to you too. You deserve it. You know, don't save it for the kids. Um, there's, there's plenty of this love to go around. Give it to yourself and then share it with them. That's, that's how it's effective. Wonderful, man. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant answer. And um, <clears throat> thanks for sharing that. Well, it's, it's true, though, you know, like, you know, today I was frustrated, you know, I get upset, um, but we don't stay there. You know, I think that's the big key. Right. And, and we also right. have the ability to recognize it where that's where people, I don't. And that's why I'm super passionate about um, meditation, because you realize that you are not your thoughts and that you don't just go into action. Right. Just because you're mad, yes. you don't throw a tantrum and flip the table. You realize it's an emotion. And then you get the choice to act how you want to act. So, you know, even if you start out with like getting really angry and you're a kid and you want to throw a crayon, you're like, you know what? I do want to throw this crayon and chuck it. You know, you can learn from that. There's steps, you know what I mean? But yeah. awareness is step one, right? Right. Oh, Matt, that's actually brilliant and so perfectly succinctly put. Because a lot of the times, especially with my perfectionistic performers and, and high achievers tend to have a certain amount of that. They don't want those feelings. They don't want those urges. And you're going to struggle to eradicate them. You're going to be lost forever. The very best that you can do is exactly as you put it, which is to be able to recognize that it's there and choose your reaction. And if you're doing that on a more consistent basis, that's really the model of excellence. And I, I, I tell my athletes and performers, you know, we're moving from perfectionism to excellence. You know, you want to be the perfect perfectionist? It's, it's finding a way to you know, learn from the mistakes and, and adjusting those reactions. Um, so I love the way you'd put it. I, I think that's really the, the best of the best. Amazing. Yeah, 100% agree, dude. Um, this is as nice as a two-way. So again, I, I'd like to just keep it on kids because I think a lot of the listeners here have kids. Um, what, what are, do you have any games or tools or ways that you share with your kids some of these techniques that, so they don't know and you're kind of slipping in little tools and, and then they learn them and you watch it? Um, let's, let me think. That's a good question. You know, who immediately pops to mind is a colleague, um, who honestly just did it better than I did. And, and I was trying to teach my kids meditation and mindfulness, but they weren't as into it. But how my youngest son got into it is I knew this guy who totally just translated mindfulness into the Jedi force. And he just translated everything through star Wars and he was brilliant at it. He had my son bring in uh, a lightsaber and <laughs> you know they just was very knowledgeable so in in that aspect of it so again i think he did he did a much better job of translating it to younger kids like that um for me what i have done as my kids are coming through hold on a sec but um what i have done i think more so is using the real life examples of it in um modeling in the way that I had said. So my, teen, my teenagers now, they'll lose emotional control. And so I will, instead of expecting them to, to, to know how to do all this, I always remind myself as a parent, it's my job to teach them. They're 8, 10, 12, 15, 18. They, they don't know this yet. And that shifts me into a position of becoming a teacher. So I will ask them questions. I will help them explore their feelings. I'll help them label it. And so it's not a fun game. I don't necessarily trick them. But I do let them know from a position of love and care and concern and importance that this is something that, that I wish for them and can I help them. Now, sometimes they're not open to it, so I wait until they are. <laughs> um, maybe it's a day later, right? Just, you gotta wait for those learning moments. But in general, I found that that's worked pretty well, um, going back to the principle of the modeling. And when they can't do it, I validate their feelings and I understand that they can't. I validate, and I think this is another big deal, that when they're angry and they're upset, I never tell them that they shouldn't feel that way because that just you know, pushes them away. I help them understand why they're feeling that way and then say, what do you want to do about it? And that I think gives them a very different relationship with their emotions as not something that's good or bad or something that needs to be controlled. It models for them. It's happening. Accept it. Now, what do you want to do according to your character and, and our family values? So it's a little bit of a daily work, but, but no games or tricks. Yeah, man, I think that last uh, little bit there is super powerful in, you know, having them validate it to say, look, I, you know, you sh you're feeling it, you know, that's t totally fine. Um, yeah, we could use a di different better word than tricks, you know, I'm imagining like a five year old where you gamify it, you know what I mean? Or yeah. the thing rather, you know, just encourage, right? And so the perspective of fun and games, 
you know, they don't know what's happening, but you're teaching about the force, maybe, I don't know, the energy body or positive thinking, you know, like, oh, you're going to go to the dark side if you give it energy because you're aware we all will have the choice to go to the Sith Lords and we all have the choice yeah. to the Jedi, right? So, but yeah. it's going to be your action and what you do with that emotion that's going to decide which way you're going to go. So, um, so okay. yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so I know you got to run. It's been short. It's been powerful um, and spot on, man. I think, you know, I think in 35, 40 minutes, you, you gave a lot of really in-depth stuff. And I like how we kind of went to the kids with it because, you know, I didn't know you were a father of four. And that's really beautiful because I think that when we empower kids and this becomes a normal thing, you know what I mean? Really proper education around mindset, mindfulness, uh, personal psychology. And we can learn from the greatest athletes to bring it into daily life for anybody a housewife an artist uh, you know somebody who works yeah. at your typical job you know it doesn't matter it's it's all applicable and it really can change your life and it changes how you move through life it changes how you feel and that's what we want for kids and that's what we want for other people is to feel enough to feel um, that they're achieving their best and that no matter what happens at the end of the day, they can still come home full of self-love, self-worth, um, and just use it as a growth experience because that's all life is anyways. Yeah. And by all means, you know, I love what you're doing. Congratulations on your work and your approach. I appreciate the opportunity to come here. And so I invite the listeners that if you like what, what Matt and I have been talking about, you know, invite me back, right? I'm happy to do this again. Choose another topic. Uh, we'll, we'll make another run at it. Uh, you know, we'll keep this friendship going. 100 percent yeah man we'll get more in depth and you know i'm sure like the way and i like that you're you're definitely more structured i have um which is good because there, there's there's ways to go about it and i love seeing how different people do it and how they educate because as we learn and grow together um you know we, everybody wins and that's what it's about is you know the podcast is for helping those who listen and then they can help their kids they can help their community and then you know feedback from you helps me become a better uh you know human being and a better coach and so you know the co-creation is something that I, i'm very very passionate about and and really helping uh, each other learn and grow and, and live a just uh a more fulfilling life and, and one where they're nicer to themselves because it's the mind yeah. that really does it. You know, it's the mind is, is everything. And, and we undervalue that I think as a society. So, um, yeah, I'd love to talk about self, the power of self-compassion and to help perfectionism and, and its role in performance, man. We, we could spend hours, Matt. <laughs> That's the start of the next one, man, because it's an, it's a never ending pursuit. And I, and I love that yeah. topic. Because it's something I, I work on personally and, and I help others with. So I know we only got a couple of minutes. Do you want to just leave the listeners with uh, anything? Uh, you know, what do you want to leave them with? And then make sure you link them to your website and stuff. Sure. Um, I think if I leave you with anything more, I don't want to dilute what we've said. So I would really just reinforce that as I think about the clients that I've worked with, it's really always come back to that idea of, being able to get distance from thoughts and feelings. And I might just add and clarify, it doesn't mean that your thoughts and feelings don't matter. And of course, it doesn't mean that we could ever go about and not attach to thoughts and feelings. Because if I did, I'd never leave the couch, right? So the one part that maybe I've missed that I would add is spending time to clarify ultimately what your core values are. Um, like for me, it, it ends up being you know family, spirituality, honesty, strength. And then that dictates what I do. As I mentioned, I just went to my CrossFit workout. And, you know, I know that I can't skip that because it's my core value and that I'll prioritize my family over, you know, some other things. And when we know who we are and we make decisions that reflect those values, it also makes it much easier to go through the suffering and service of those values. So the performance model that I use is a combination of that, the, the mindfulness uh, to observe, the identification of the values, and then accepting what you have to to that direction. So that's that's sort of the gist of it. If you'd like to know more about that, um, Dr. Eddie O'Connor, D R E D D I E O C O N N O R dot com is my website. Um, at Dr. Eddie O'Connor is Facebook, and at Sports Dr. Eddie S P O R T S D R E D D I E on both uh, Instagram and Twitter. And if it's easier to remember, hashtag M T I N sixty S E C for my mental toughness in sixty seconds. It's been um, I got about 90 videos up as of today. Um, and it's just something I started doing about three months ago where I just said, let me just start talking into the phone about what was on my mind that day, two, three days a week, uh, put it up on social media. And it's gotten a wonderful response to how we met. Um, and that's just been a blast. And I like to keep it very practical. So, you know, free tips for life, um, if you uh, 
use hashtag MTIN 60 seconds. Awesome, brother. Cool, man. Well, what a great closing statement. And uh, again, really powerful 40 minutes. Thank you for your work, for doing uh, what you're doing. Uh, you know, good luck to the kids. Uh, keep up the amazing Thanks. work. And we, you and I will definitely get connected and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll drop another podcast and, and really get into it. And all, for all the listeners, if you have any uh, questions, Freddie, let us know because it seems like yeah. you can go family and go into peak performance or whatever. So we can co-create something, you, myself and the audience. So, uh, Thanks for everything, brother, and uh, I'll, co I'll connect with you in the next one. All right. Sounds great. Thanks very much, Matt. Take care, all. See you guys.